Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to welcome you to this service of worship here at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so grateful that you are taking time out of your day today to worship with us, and we'd love the chance to connect with you. So if you would take a moment and either click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and worshiping and also let us know how we can be praying for you this week. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be on your screen. Let's pray now together. Gracious God, give to us the mind of Christ, who loved God and loved his neighbor, who healed the sick, fed the hungry, and prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him. May we follow his path in this life and the life to come. Amen. service for the weight of human need, who upon the cross forsaken offered mercy's perfect deed. We your servants bring to worship, not a voice alone but heart, consecrating to your purpose every gift that you impart. worship to your service forth in your dear name we go to the child the youth the aged love and living deeds to show hope and health goodwill and comfort counsel aid and peace we give that your servants lord in freedom may your mercy know and live Hello, Church. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Let us go before God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, thank you for calling us into this place of worship. We come before you seeking your grace and love, knowing that when we stumble, you lift us up, not with judgment, but with compassion. You offer us hope forgiveness, and a path toward new beginnings. Lord, teach us to love as you love. Help us to see each person through your eyes, not through the lens of their mistakes, but through the potential for growth and change. Soften our hearts, and may we extend the same mercy that you so freely offer us. We all carry the burdens of our own mistakes, but your love covers us, giving us the courage to rise, to, make, to be made whole, and to move forward in your light. So may your love transform us. Lord, we pray for peace in our heart, in communities, and in country. Help us, Lord, not to be divided by politics and fear. Instead, give us a spirit of understanding. Teach us to love each other deeply, even when we disagree. As we share our views and opinions, we do so with love, not violence. May we respect one another's voices without causing harm. Let this season not be one of bitterness, but of hope for a future where we care for one another and seek the well-being of all your children. 
Lord, we want to lift us, those who are struggling with the challenges. Especially we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, hear our prayers. Meet your people in their situations and turn into places of grace where they can experience your love and care. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our hearts and um, gift. As we respond to God's grace and generosity, you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church by mail or via website. Let us continue to worship God. I'm Pastor Eun Soo. How are you today? I'm so excited to share this time with y'all. So today, here is a white piece of paper. What does this paper look like? Mm, it's clean, mm, it's nice, and it's smooth, right? So let's imagine this is our heart. But what happens when someone does or says something unkind to us? Yeah, this is like our heart when you feel hurt or upset. It is so sad, right? It feels all crumples up inside. Well, sometimes when someone hurts us, it can feel hard to forgive them. And it is easy to feel like judging them and saying like, you did something wrong. But you know what? Jesus shows a different way. Instead of judgment, Jesus chooses love because love and forgiveness bring healing. So it might still show some lines and wrinkles here. But when we choose love and forgiveness, it helps smooth out the wrinkles in our heart and the heart of others. Do you think it is easy to forgive and love someone who hurt you? No, it is really hard, right? But Jesus shows that love and forgiveness are more powerful than judgment. And even though things might not go back to being perfect, love and forgiveness help us move forward and live better. So when we forgive, we help others feel loved and that love can change their way they live. So it helps them make better choices and share kindness with others. So let us remember when someone made a mistake, let us choose love and forgiveness. It helps them to be feel loved and also help them to choose a better one and also share that love with others. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Help us to love and forgive others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hello, and grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and we're continuing our series called Be Like Jesus. 
Today we're going to pick up John chapter 8 and hear a really fascinating story. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who'd been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Lord, I pray that uh, you might speak through me, that you might use me. And if uh, I say things that aren't of you, I pray that they will quickly be forgotten. Lord, speak to us anew this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we pick up the story in the temple, the very same temple where Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers in last week's sermon. On this day, Jesus was teaching when the scribes and Pharisees brought in a woman and said, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say, Jesus? While this woman and her sin are put on full display in front of everyone, Jesus was put on the spot by the scribe's question. What would the great teacher say? Well, there are a couple of things worth noticing about this accusation. First of all, the law the Pharisees are referring to is found in a couple of places in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10 probably says it the simplest. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. Now I wonder if you notice anything about that law. Because there's something missing in how the scribes and Pharisees bring this accusation. Did you see it? The law commands both parties to be punished. But where's the man? Maybe we could assume they didn't see him. That's not really a possibility though. To gain conviction in Jewish law required a very specific type of witness. At least two witnesses must agree on absolutely everything. And on top of two witnesses agreeing, they had to actually see the act being played out. In other words, it wouldn't work if they saw her leaving the room or in some compromising situation. They had to see the act itself, which is, um, well, well, I'm moving on. That's what it is. Uh, so these religious leaders are saying that they saw the woman in the act of adultery. Now, if that's the case, where's the man? Why is it so often that only women bear the shame of sexual sin? Some speculate that maybe the woman was set up. Maybe the man was even among those in the accusing party. The text doesn't tell us that, so we can't be sure. I don't really like jumping to such conclusions. But if these scribes and Pharisees were really concerned about upholding the law, they should have brought the man too, since by their own accusation they had definitely seen him too. But the woman was enough for their purposes. They were using her to trap Jesus. They are taking her shame for their gain. You see, they were more threatened by Jesus than they were actual lawbreakers. There's no formal trial here. There's only an accusation and then a question. What do you say, Jesus? Now let's consider the stakes here. If Jesus didn't uphold the law, then all he said about fulfilling the law would just be a lie. But if he did uphold the law and commanded stoning, well, that wouldn't jive with his insistence on grace and mercy and the compassion that he showed sinners throughout his ministry. So you see what's on the line here? It's not an easy one. It comes down to this. Is Jesus just or is he just compassionate? 
Well, as the famous Presbyterian pastor Tim Keller once said, Jesus combines compassion and justice so perfectly that the world has never seen its like. So how did Jesus respond? Verse 6, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. What did he write? <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool to know? Fortunately, immediately afterward, he wrote, after he wrote in the dirt, he spoke. In verse 7, he stood up and said some of the most famous words ever spoken. Let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. Boom. Drop the mic. Let's not overlook the brilliance of this comeback. Notice what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, don't throw any stones. What did he say? He said, go ahead, but make sure the one who throws it is without sin. He trapped the trappers. He confronted the confronters. He accused the accusers. He completely turned the tables on them. He said, you want to apply the law? Then let's apply the law. It's a brilliant move. He didn't deny the law. He applied the law. And no one could stand before it. No one there was without sin except for him. No one was qualified to throw the first stone but him. And he didn't do it. We'll look at why in just a minute. Let's go on. Verse 9 says, When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. Why the older ones first? Maybe because as you age, you start to realize just how far from perfect you really are. You can trick yourself into thinking you're not that bad when you're young. There are things you would never do. And so as long as you're on the right side of some standard that you convince yourself of, well, then you can convince yourself you're a decent person. But the longer you live, the harder it becomes to keep up that self-image. You mature. You get it. And so after the older ones started the trend, eventually everyone left. They realized they don't have the righteousness required to throw the first stone. Whatever we want to say about the scribes and the Pharisees, I think it's disingenuous to say that they didn't actually want to obey God. They did. They just missed the point. The focus now turns from the accusers to the accused. Moments before, the angry crowd was ready to stone the woman. Now, not a single person was left to condemn her. Those who had come to shame Jesus now leave and shame themselves. And all that's left is the woman and Jesus. Now that's not necessarily good news for her, not yet anyway, because Jesus didn't say no stones need to be thrown. He only said whoever's without sin, go ahead and throw it. Jesus is the only one without sin. He's the only one who could truly condemn her, the only one who could throw the first stone. Would he? She knew what she deserved. What's Jesus going to do? He does the most amazing thing. Jesus confronts the accusers, but he also comforts the accused, which is our second big point today. Jesus stood there, looked at the woman, and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Do you realize this is actually the first time in the story that anyone addresses the woman? The scene is so humiliating. They dragged her in, accused her of adultery, demanded her death, but until then, no one's ever actually said anything to the woman. Now, Jesus didn't start with her sin. He started with her accusers. Isn't that interesting? And so just like Jesus. When she answered that none of them condemned her, Jesus said something amazing. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. But wait, there's more. How can Jesus possibly say this? Well, in a way, he could say it because now that everyone's gone, there's no real case against her. The charges are dropped, as it were. But there's a more puzzling question here. See, the scribes and Pharisees weren't totally wrong. If the law was violated, doesn't that demand some sort of punishment? Shouldn't Jesus act justly? Is he now ignoring the law? Well, again, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, you aren't guilty. The last thing he tells her is to sin no more. He's not saying she's innocent. But he doesn't condemn her either. Isn't that interesting? 
Jesus, the Son of God, is the most holy person that's ever lived. He can't overlook sin because if God overlooks sin, well, that's a problem. How can there be any justice in the world if God overlooks sin? Here's where we get straight to the heart of Christianity. Christianity says that we are guilty, but we're not condemned. How can that be? If we're guilty, we must be condemned. Justice demands it. If we're truly guilty, there's no way around it. Try telling parents whose child's been murdered that there'll be no condemnation for the person who murdered their precious child. They'd be outraged, and rightly so. So how can Jesus say this? How can we be guilty and not condemned? Well, perhaps the most amazing verse in the Bible, Romans 8.1, says it best. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's how we can be guilty but not condemned. If we're in Christ. It can only be true if Jesus takes our guilt for us. It only works if 2 Corinthians 5.21 is true. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Only if Jesus takes our guilt and our sin and pays the price for us can we not be condemned. It's only true if Jesus is condemned for us. The guilt and sin don't just disappear. The penalty's got to be paid. Somebody's got to pay it. For those of you who are fans of C.S. Lewis, you've probably read the book or seen the movie The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. In this story, the lion, who goes by the name of Aslan, gives himself up to the evil white witch in exchange for Edmund, the one who's actually made the mistake in the story. Aslan pays the penalty for Edmund's sin. This is what Jesus does for us. We can only be condemned, excuse me, we can only be guilty but not condemned if Jesus upholds the law for us. Jesus can only not condemn this woman now if he's going to be condemned for her later on. And that's exactly what he's going to do. Jesus knows she ought to be stoned. But instead of throwing the first stone, he'll let stones be thrown at him. Instead of her being crushed beneath the weight of their blows, he's going to die upon the cross for the sins of the world. Jesus didn't condemn her then because he was going to be condemned for her later. That's why Paul says in Romans 3.26 that God is both just and the justifier. He is just in that no sin will go unpunished, but for his people, he's also the justifier, the one who sets things right on the cross. That's the only way this works. He can only forgive because he's going to pay the penalty himself. That's at the heart of Christianity. Left before Jesus, the only one who really could condemn her, she finds a rock she didn't expect to receive. A rock that will become the cornerstone to a new foundation for her life. And if she found that, well, I bet you can too. This is not a one-off story. One of the things that makes this so powerful is that this is the normative way that Jesus works. We don't see this happen just here in John chapter 8. We see it all throughout his interactions in the Bible. And we're going to keep exploring these actions throughout this fall season. Because over and over again, we see Jesus moving towards sinners and sufferers in ways that shock and surprise us. Jesus shows us that God's heart isn't trigger happy to condemn us. In Luke 7, for instance, when a woman pours ointment on Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair and kisses them, the Pharisees are repulsed by this. But Jesus welcomes her and forgives her of her sins. In Luke 19, Jesus goes and eats with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, an outcast in Jewish society who has taken their money and given it to the hated Romans. And when the friends of a paralytic bring their suffering friend to him in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus didn't even wait for them to speak. He sees their faith and he tells the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And the paralytic gets up and walks. As Jesus travels and sees the crowds, he has compassion on them. He stood outside Jerusalem and he wept over them. And then he went to the cross and he died for them. The thing that pours out most naturally from Jesus' heart is this compassion for the undeserving. 
In his book, Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortland says it this way, Time and again, it is the morally disgusting, the socially reviled, the inexcusable and undeserving, who do not simply receive Christ's mercy, but to whom Christ most naturally gravitates. He is, by his enemy's own words, the friend of sinners. When you come to Jesus caught in the act, you expect the full weight of the law to crash into you. It's what you deserve. But with Jesus, you get what you don't deserve. You're guilty but not condemned because he's con going to be condemned for you. All you have to do to receive this is just receive this. Just open your empty hands of faith and accept his cleansing power of forgiveness. That's the scandalous grace of the gospel. Now Jesus comforted her by not condemning her, but he didn't stop there. Look again at verse 11. He says, go and from now on sin no more. We've got to remember this. Jesus did not merely say, I don't condemn you. He also said, and sin no more. True Christianity is both the full grace and forgiveness found in Christ and a call to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. It includes both melting before His grace and stepping into the obedience that He calls us to. He forgives and He challenges. But notice the order. It's so important to notice the order. He could have said, I won't condemn you if you never do it again. That's what we would say. But he didn't say that, did he? His grace came first. And that grace empowers obedience. This is how we know Jesus really loved that woman and how we know he loves us too. If he only forgives and doesn't care how we then go out and live our lives, does he really care about us at all? If he only sends us back into the same old lifestyle that got us dragged into accusation, dragged into pain, and in this case, dragged into potential death in the first place, well, what good is that? Is that what you would do to someone you loved? Of course not. Real love is loving someone enough to help them change into the person that you know they can be. Jesus loves like that all the time. That's why he calls us to obedience. He wants us to be like him. We can't do that unless we obey him. But we can't obey him, not truly, until we've been changed by his grace and his mercy. Don't mistake the order and don't mistake his love for you. Real grace forgives us completely. And real love calls us to something higher. Only in Christianity do sinners become saints. Now, how does this passage help us today? Well, I think in two ways, personally and corporately. First, personally, who among us is qualified to throw stones? Okay, if we're honest, we know we deserve punishment too. Many of us, we feel so broken, so unworthy, even sometimes repulsive to God. We might even wonder if we're even Christian. Well, when your heart condemns you, Know that God is greater than your heart, and he knows everything. Do not wallow in your sin. You are not repulsive to Jesus. You do not shock him. Jesus came to save people like you. He wants you to know that. He wants you to experience the cleansing power that only he can give. Your most desperate need, when you are most desperate, is not to get your act together so that then you can then come to him. It's to simply come to him first. And then receive from his deep well of grace upon grace. Only then will you even have a chance at getting your act together. Don't take your problems to the law. Take them to the gospel. If you go to the law, you'll get justice, which will crush you. That's its job. But if you go to Jesus, you'll find that the law has been fulfilled on your behalf. And therefore, you can find grace and peace. Now here's how this helps us corporately. If the only person who had the moral perfection to throw stones at the woman didn't do it, let's be real careful about picking up any stones to throw at other people as well. I mean, sin is serious, but it's no match for Jesus cleansing blood. Let's always remember the heart of Jesus for sinners and sufferers. If we're to make an impact at all in this judgmental and condemning world, we're going to do it 
by stepping into the grace of Jesus altogether. We're going to do it by laying aside our weapons, our stones, our words, otherwise, and coming together to find the mercy of Christ for us all. I don't know about you, but I got enough of my own sins to worry about. I don't need to go looking at yours. I have enough need for forgiveness from for Jesus to keep me on my knees for a long time. Don't you? So we've got two options. We can become a community that radiates the beauty of Christ so profoundly that condemnation is only something we know we've been saved from. Or we can become a community that's constantly judging and condemning others and is so hard to please that even Jesus himself wouldn't be welcome. Let's continue to cultivate a gospel culture where Jesus is our greatest love. Where sin isn't safe, but sinners are. Where we take each other to the gospel instead of to task. Where we together boldly approach the throne of grace to find the help that we need. Where we treat no sin too lightly nor too heavily because Jesus commands real obedience. But he forgives the worst we can do because he already paid the price. And because he paid the price, we don't have to. Let's not ever make anyone pay for what Jesus has already paid for. Let's love him together, and let's see what only he can do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Jesus, when we messed up, you took our sins to the cross. Thank you for forgiving us. Help us not to wallow in our sins, but to look up, to live by a higher standard, to be more holy and righteous. Lord, help us also not to look down on others just because their sins are different from ours. Help us to reach out and help others up too. We ask this in your most precious name. Amen. Jesus has already paid the price for your sins and for everyone else's. So, please, don't wallow in your sins. And you don't have to point out anyone else's either. As Christians, we need to be in the build them up business not the tear them down business. Let's be more like Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.